Alright, hit this button. Yeah. Alright, ready to go? Yeah. Alright. Hello and welcome to Lorecast from Aetherite Radio, GamerEscape.com's Final Fantasy XIV podcast talking about anything and everything lore. I'm Fusion X and joining me today, we have the one and only Anwil. How's it going? What's going on? So today, uh, we had the uh, opening cinematic for Heaven's Word came out of uh, the, the letter from the producer live. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Uh, not so much lore stuff, maybe a little bit of speculation thrown in there for some stuff, um, but we want to discuss it a little bit. Um, but before we can get to that, we have to talk about everything that happened in patch 2.5. There was a lot of stuff. Um, and so if you're tuning, well, obviously, if you're just tuning in, it's the beginning of the show. Um, spoilers. We are going to spoil absolutely everything for the end of A Realm Reborn. So if you don't know what happens and you don't want to know what happens, turn this off right now. Oh, I think at this point, I mean, anybody who got up excited this morning to see the trailer knows what happens. It's, yeah, it's, it's kind of at the point, and this, and this worked out well, I think, timing-wise, because we wanted... Uh, a little bit of time to kind of let it sink in, maybe have some some ideas pop in our heads. Um, but with the letter from the producer this morning, you know, it's Square Enix is kind of, okay, you should know what happens by now. Here's the trailer. Like, you know, <laughs> you've had your time. Um, which is funny, too, because they showed that, uh, the I forget what they called it, the, the Truth of Flame or the Flame of Truth video for that had the, the cutscene from uh, the Binding Coil. In oh, there, yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't even remember them saying that they were going to show that. They're just like, oh, hey, by the way, if you haven't done Coil, uh, here. <laughs> like, I, was, I was more surprised someone hadn't, like, manually put it together. Well, I mean, that I found. I'm sure someone has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah. I was, I was sorry. I was reading the chat. I got distracted. Too many. <laughs> There's text and voices, and they don't say the same thing, and it's thrown me off. Uh, yeah, the uh, Heaven's Word trailer is up. It is up on the uh, Final Fantasy XIV uh, YouTube channel. It's also up. We got it uh, featured post on Gamerscape.com. Check it out. It is incredibly epic. And if you are a dragoon or you like dragoons, chances are this will be the best trailer you have ever seen. Uh, you know? Time for the dragoon has come. <laughs> I'm imagining just all of all of the dragoons who have been dealing with with people's oh he's dead again crap for the past year now longer if you've been in 11 are just yeah, it's it's right. my time oh it's so good it's, so, it's just i mean i can i can remember back to uh to to, to the fan fest in vegas watching that trailer and, and the ending with all the dragoons i'm just like oh my god so good so good uh but yeah let's go ahead uh and jump right into uh to patch 2.5 before the fall what do you got for us okay the first thing that you have to talk about is just the tone of the ending. Um, the the entirety of 2.0 so far has been uplifting and positive, and it's been all about hope, uh, rebirth, renewal, the success of the game, taking around something that was crashing and just bringing it right back up to something to be proud of. And just as we get there, and just as we get confirmation that we're moving on to something bigger and brighter in the whole future thing, it's gone. It's all gone. You're screwed. Credits roll. And it's not even like it's just kind of like like I'm going over here, guys. Like I'll see you later. You're like oh, bye, bye, hope and and positive feelings. It's like no, it like pushes you off a ledge and then jumps down from that ledge and starts kicking you in the gut. I loved that. I loved that Square Enix <laughs> was willing to just take everything that they've been building up and just kind of shove us right off of the platform. Yeah. And I mean, we've we've heard too um, back at how oh, was this? I think E3 last year during the live letter, uh, they said this is going to be a very like much like a darker final fantasy a much more mature final fantasy and we are definitely feeling that it's a wise choice because i mean this game in my humble opinion is a love letter to final fantasy one through six but back then i mean it wasn't so strange to have a high fantasy feel where everything is just this is magic this is the bad guy very simple clear cut etc etc um, this is much more complicated, much more mature, and like all things, it should be a little darker when you get into that territory. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think it's interesting too. Um, you know, we—I mean, granted, there's millions of subs for this game now, but um, you have to consider that a, a decent chunk of that audience is probably people that have been, you know, with. I mean, the, the franchise as you know a whole is uh, like what 27 years old now, 28 years old. 
Um, and so people that have been with Final Fantasy, um, you know, since the beginning, uh, you know, they're older now, so they're going to want a more darker, or more mature game. You know, not not to say that they wouldn't still enjoy um, something, you know, in the vein of some of the earlier titles, but um, it's kind of gr- like growing up with, with its fan base a little bit, I think. Um, and, and a lot of, the, you know, people now... Um, you look at you know stuff like Game of Thrones is hugely popular, and that's like really like dark and gritty, um, and so I think it's you know kind of the way that some stuff is going you know with with you know fantasy and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's 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 dark, man. It's a weird comparison, but I, it actually kind of reminds me of the um, the Harry Potter progression where it started as very mm, friendly yes, reading yes. in grade school, and then, then I'm I'm in high school reading the last book, and all of a sudden it's a freaking Friday the Thirteenth movie. Yeah, Harry Potter's all like, "Hey, you're a wizard, and 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 your best friend's brothers have a joke shop." By the way, now one of them is dead, and yeah, let's just like it just it gets it gets started real quick in Harry Potter. Now, Patch clearly wants us to think that that we've lost a lot of people, um, but I think I think in the end we may only have lost the Sultana. I think um, the whole it, or or, di- or did we? Or did we? Yeah, great. We have to bring that into it in a minute, too. Um, <clears throat> I think the whole foreshadowing with, with Tataru um, giving away the thing so that everybody will always come home, and then you have the very ambiguous, uh, I don't want to call them death scenes, but, you know, temporary farewell scenes. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's much more interesting because you're, you know, there's there's a little, it's, it's, the, the the bit with with Tataru, right? It's weird because you get that quest alongside another main scenario quest, and you know, so you have like two that you can flag at once, which is kind of weird. Um, and so you, it feels almost kind of like a little like aside, right? You go right. off and you, you you know you hang out with Tataru a little bit. Um, and I, I played, I me and the the girlfriend at the main scenario together the for for two point five five. And as we're going along, I'm like, oh my god, they're making us emotionally attached to where they're gonna kill her. Like, you know, like, I was, I was. This, so this is how they that. set it up. They get you all like invested, like right towards the end, and then they're like, done. Like, That's, like I, I, hope, I hope you didn't like that character too much. I thought they were gonna do the Moonbreda thing all over again, where they where they really cram a whole lot of feels into a small section just so they can kind of exploit it at the end. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, I was. I'm gonna riot if anything happens to Tataru. I mean, before we get into the to the bigger obvious part of this subject, um, the less optimistic side are now even implicating Tataru in this whole thing because as she's walking away, she kind of has like that. She has that really weird expression, like right, the five she's goodbyes, up to something, and the grin. Um, so now everybody's suspicious of her, like, oh, she's the one who cooks the books in the first place, and then someone else comes in, well, for the Scions, or for the Crystal Braves, too, and, and, Mm -hmm. I don't know, I will be crushed. She has been the embodiment of all good things. I feel like if she, if she was that kind of person, she probably wouldn't have, like, gone mining for extra prof, like, money, like, a couple patches ago. Um, another thought that I had... Um, because we haven't seen the Asians like really like out there for I mean well the last patch right we we kind of right, the whole Nabriales arc yeah we, we pretended that uh, that he was odd and we trapped him in a crystal um, but it's all these different storylines have been kind of weaving in and out right they come up for a patch and then they kind of fade away for a little bit and then they come back um, I'm wondering what if Tataru got dark crystalled that was one of the things that came in with the suspicions about because this patch had a heavy focus on um her skills as a bookkeeper and also a heavy focus on how the books were cooked for the um braves and some people might connect that as a hint that tataru was involved or some might just uh chalk it up as a coincidence because the books for the braves ended up being cooked kind of badly if real could spot it so easily mm-hmm. um but i wouldn't I wouldn't be able to handle it. The thing that does it for me is, you know, every time you're having a conversation with a cutscene flag and it's just an excuse for another cutscene to come in and interrupt you so you can watch them interact. Mm-hmm. When Tataru does that, she runs in and she'll be like, oh, antecedent, need to speak with you. But then she'll stop and she'll turn towards your character and give it a polite wave and then go back and talk to Minfilia. And I'm like, no one who does that can be evil. I'll lose right. all my faith in humanity. Yeah. Uh, hu- humanity. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely interesting. I mean, she 
and, and again, you know, as you go through this this last, you know, uh, quest line, they're like, oh, like, you know, they're kind of getting buddy buddy, and you know, like like thank grid. If you if you pay attention, right, that's that's the only downside to some of the stuff is as you're doing these quests is. Um, like if you're in the Rising Stones, there's the NPCs that are just kind of chilling, like in the you know like through the different like quests and the phases, right? Um, and you know you notice little things, um, like early on in in 2.55, like apparently Thancred and had a few female um, companions, and all of them fantastic. were kind of fighting over him, and you know little stuff like that that kind of reminds you of you know who those characters are, why we like them so much. Um, it actually started last patch um, yeah. when Moonbrita is trying to gather materials for what they're going to use to trap the Asian. Um, Than Cred sends Ida to Uldao to pick up some of the materials, and Ida makes kind of a side comment that when she picked it up for him, uh, the girl she was picking it up from was furious. Yeah. And she couldn't figure out why this girl was screaming at her and calling her names. And in this patch, Ida's the one standing in the corner laughing her ass off as Than Cred's being assaulted by all these ladies. Yeah, I thought that was really funny. And it's it's little stuff like that that's like, okay, they're they're trying to, you know, warm us up to the character a little bit. What are they gonna do to him, you know? <laughs> I've appreciated everything they've done with Dan Cred, actually. Oh, yeah. I he used to he used to annoy me. I thought he was too smug, I thought he was too arrogant. And in this patch, or well, this whole um uh version really, version two point oh, you find out that this is all an act he puts on because he puts on so much pressure on himself. Mm-hmm. And that was I I appreciated that. Give him a little more character. Yeah. Um, Yashtola, we still don't know anything about. That well, frustrates me because she's from my city. We actually we do know a little bit about her, um, and, and it's funny because we actually talked about this before the patch dropped. Uh, she has a sister. She does. We didn't know for sure until now. Um, there's a, there's a character that looks a lot like her, uh, has the same um, tribal modifier in the front of the name, and mentions a sister, but we didn't have any proof until now. So that's cool to have. We know she's got family here. Yeah, and uh, for for those of you uh, who who didn't catch that, um, her sister is the one that you do all of the uh, summoner quests from. Correct, yeah, Yamitra. Yeah, so sisters, and it's, it's so weird because we talked about that, and then we're like, oh yeah, like she might be like related, and then then the patch comes, oh yeah, totally, okay, we got that. Um, similarly, we we talked um, before. Oh geez, I think even before. 2.5 hit right um we we put up a, a little bit of a a lore crafting article talking about how we thought the sultana might die yeah um, and it was it was an interesting back and forth between the two of us because i thought i'm like yeah like totally and you're like eh, i don't know and we kind of you know we're digging around and eventually we we published an article and yeah totally totally hit the nail on the head with that sucker she you got poison it. she dropped the cup and uh, and it was interesting because as you're doing those quests leading up to that scene, um, it's like, oh, like there's a vial here. That's weird. You pick it up. And like as soon as that happens, I'm like, oh, crap, they're going to frame me. <laughs> like I just I knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, and it's it's so weird the way that it plays out, because one of our biggest questions um, that kind of went against that that idea of the Sultana getting killed was. But what happens with, you know, there's that culinarian quest she's a part of, yep, yep. Um, you know, this kind of idea of just old Abby in this state of chaos. Like, how does that get reflected in game? Um, and then they throw another one in there. Oh, by the way, now you're like wanted for murdering the Sultana. So it's like, what? How can I even go to old Abby anymore? Uh, which is, I got to say, it feels really, really weird to be one of the immortal flames right now. It feels really weird. It feels um, weird for me even visiting. Yeah, like I, I feel I'm just like I'm just getting some ventures for retainers. Like just look the other way. Don't mind me. The whole um, the whole progression for me was weird. Um, because in January, right after we had learned the very first things about this patch and talking more about Heaven's Word, you approached me with like, I think she's the one who's gonna bite it. And I thought, well, that's, that's an odd choice. I mean, I would have gone with, I guess, maybe Minfilia. Her role as a, as a leader and mentor might be over. Now's a good time to kind of sacrifice the mentor, move to season two. But I uh, I started looking into it when you threw the idea out, and we saw that the goblet was just like her crown with the jewels for her eyes, and it's fallen in the thing. And then, if you look closer, uh, there's actually a lala fell inside the goblet. So that it really, was my it really wasn't. It wasn't us that called it. It was the goblet. The goblet foretold. That a lava fell was gonna die. 
I'm still not even convinced that that's not, not just an optical illusion. But like when I when I first saw it and brought it to you, I'm like, this this is going to spur in at least some discussion. We've got to oh, talk. Yeah. About it's it. it's one of those things. Once you see it, that's all you see when you look at that image. Cannot unsee the Lala felt in the cup. Yeah, um, and if, if you guys haven't seen that, uh, go check out our lore crafting piece um, on on this, and and we got a, an image uh, kind of highlighted showing the the Lala fell. Uh, and they got, it, it really does look like that. It's, he did. It's I, I thought he was. I thought he was crazy for the first few minutes, and then after I started digging up some info for it, I'm like, oh god, you're right. So we uh, we put out the lore crafting piece and tried to get some discussion going. And then, I mean, remember we talked about what happens in the culinary quest, which accidentally mm-hmm. became a very um, passionate point in the debate of whether or not this is going yeah. to happen. Unfortunately, but uh, now we know. The truth of how this works. We are still in the time bubble, mm. um, but content canonically happens in the patch that it is released in. Um, I think it's safe to say uh, because if you don't if you don't know this yet, if you go back and do the culinary storyline, now she's there, she's alive. There's no explanation for it whatsoever. You're cooking dinner for the dead. She didn't actually die. Is what happened. That's yeah, a very prominent theory <laughs> right now. It's I, it's, it's interesting, right? Sure. Because. It, in one hand, you want to entertain the idea, right? But on the other, you're like, you need to let go. Like, she's gone. You just need to accept it and move on. <laughs> this is something that I feel actually should be in this podcast. Because um, I can explain myself clearly now. Uh, I am perfectly okay with fake deaths. Um, you know, kind of give her the Juliet syndrome. She only looks dead. Only and, we, and we know guys is totally dead. still alive somewhere. We, oh, I... <laughs> Uh, it's a whole other can yeah, like, all right, So here's, I guess we can sidetrack to Gaius for a minute. Um, if you look at him very closely, his his storyline has a very clear rise and fall. But because he had the scion death at the end there, uh, I'm very hesitant to make a rise and fall of the of the black wolf. We'll call it something something else. I, I think as soon as as soon as uh, 4.0 or 5.0, whatever Alamigo is in that's what i'm thinking too he's he's coming back i'm thinking in this in this patch they had a discussion about whether they'd like to do c or sky i think i remember them saying yeah um not to bring it into the 11 but like swimming or flying content and flying content one uh i'm thinking we might eventually see uh swimming content and if we do i expect everybody to join my uh petition for sid to build a blitz ball sphere i could see that being a thing yeah um, but I, I expect next, because we're going to Ishgard now, would be the reclamation of Alamigo. And that would be the perfect time to reintroduce some mm-hmm. maybe only mostly dead characters. But <laughs> if if he never comes back, I'm I'm perfectly okay with how his story ended up. Mm-hmm. It might need a it might need a summary to let people know the full circle of the story, because a yeah. lot of it got lost in translation uh yeah. between 1.0 and 2.0. And, and there's there's the difference too, um, but you know, looking at, at Gaius and and Anamo is with with Gaius, he was you know he was set up at the villain, but at the same time, you know, he made a lot of good points, right? He's like, you need he to like, fight the primals and stuff, and blah blah blah. And we're like, yeah, like I could, okay, <laughs> I could see him having a change of heart, realizing, uh, you know, maybe the things he said weren't wrong, but the way he went ag- went about addressing them mm-hmm. didn't quite work out, and that maybe the Eorzean way of doing it is worth trying out. It would be cool to see him as a, maybe an anti-hero, not necessarily. Yeah, and, and we, you know, we know back from 1.0, like after Nail started doing his thing, guys was kind of like, all right, this guy is crazy. I'm just going to kind of chill back here and just see that's, what happens. And then the war of su- succession hits. And obviously we didn't, I, that whole little like underlying bit really bugs me because it's like, Hey, there's a war of succession going on in Garlemald. Oh, Okay, like, can we get some more information? Oh, somebody's a, a new upper. Oh, 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 but what happened? Like, <laughs> I want to know more about that whole thing. And they just kind of like threw it out there, and you know, here's a cutscene of the new upper spitting on the casket of the old one, and that's it. That's all we know about the empire. We got we got a little information about it. We know the um, the war of succession was between um, the uncle and the grandson. Mm. Um, the what was it? The brother. Okay, um, there's the Emperor. The Emperor had a son. The Emperor's son died mysteriously. But before he died, he had a son. Maybe he went on a date with Danamo. That was one of the two. (laughs) (laughs) 
And then the dead son had a brother as well. So that was the two gotcha. that had the big war of succession in the end. And yeah. Varys ends up winning. I could see uh, just Gaius kind of looking in from the sidelines or the shadows, right? Just kind of like watching it and being like, oh my God, you guys, like, I just, I hate you guys so much. Like, <laughs> that should be me. I'm going to, I'm going to just go and chill and Alamy go do my own thing. I could totally see him be, being like an anti hero. I think that's, that'd be great. That's my theory of why he came to Eorzea in the first place that he, he thought if he could, uh, kind of go rogue and take Eorzea as as they'd always wanted, that he would be a, a much more reasonable choice for Emperor yeah. now that it was coming down to the bickering between the, the High Legatus. Well, and that's, and and that's what it was back in 1.0, too. That's, him and Nail were kind of competing, and it got to the right. point where, where Nail was just, he's like, I want to drop the freaking moon on, on Eorzea, and guys is like, dude, you nuts. Like, I'm out of here. Like, it's just, you're insane. Um, and, you know, even, you know, he told the Emperor, he's like, this guy's crazy. He was like, no, like, we're going with his plan. I love it. Drop the moon. Done. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be interesting. But then, so you have Gaius, right? It's kind of um, villain slash, you know, like, you're supposed to hate him, but you kind of don't. And then you have Nanamo, who's just, like, the most innocent person, right? She's, you know, she loves Raban, and she cries and hugs Raban, because, you know, she can't get justice and uh, all this kind of stuff. And then they, they, they kill her and they frame you. It's like, wow. And... I mean, unlike the the um, possibly dead, maybe dead Gaius death, uh, Nanamo had a very... It was less gruesome, but I think they were trying to... Um, Game of Thrones spoiler! Bring in <laughs> the, uh, the strangler scene. I don't want to talk too much and about it. Yeah, I don't want, and that I don't was want to ruin it who hasn't seen Game of Thrones, but... That was part of my reasoning for, for that whole or crafting article is... I mean the way the way the trailer for 2.5 went right. It kind of had kicked off with this kind of sad music, and then at the end you see Namo kind of kneeling, and then the goblet falls and the logo pops. Right. Like that's a big like, hey, something's gonna happen, um, and we know that there are people um, on the dev team that love Game of Thrones. I mean, if you look back, I think it was FanFest. Koji talked about um, one of the lead quests he had was making fun of Game of Thrones. I remember um, Sir George of House Martin. Sir George his, of House Martin, yeah, and his, uh, oh. yeah, and his his uh, I forget what he called him, uh, Tywick, his <laughs> like his servant <laughs> Tywick. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like this is a, you know these people that are writing the the lore of this world um, and, and and you know planning everything out. They love like dark stuff like Game of Thrones, and you know we know what happens in Game of Thrones. People get slaughtered at you know festive events, um, and so to have you know, something with the Sultana happened. Like that's, that's one of those things where I, you know, I thought about it. And I said, Oh, they would totally do that. Like it, you know, like if you look at something, you're like, Oh, would they, would they not? It's like, Oh, they would absolutely do that. Just to, to play. Yeah. Just like devil's advocate with the other side a bit. Um, at the end, we see that a lot of this has been masterminded by Lola Rito. Which um, was surprising. That he, I, I actually question this a little bit. Um, I'll come back around to that in a minute. Um, but we see that he basically pushed Teleji into action and and masterminded a lot of this. So to play devil's advocate with that, if he wanted to shake things up and get Teleji out of the way and regain control and take most of the monetarist power for himself, he might still need the Sultana. So it is possible that perhaps he uh, tricked her into a, a Juliet-style fake death, uh, but I'm really hoping not mm -hmm. because I, I liked Nanamo. I liked what they were doing with her. I loved the idea of a powerless puppet uh, taking all of her own power back and, and walking forward without them, but as much as I wanted to see that future, they played the card at the ending. It wasn't during part one, 2.55, they kill her, and part two, surprise, it was all a very elaborate ruse, here's the ending. It was they went for the death in the ending to evoke the emotion. And if they undo that, I think it was yeah. a um, exploitative punch in the gut. And it's it's interesting, too, because they do it at the ending. I mean, you know, Heaven's Word is not so, like, finally we get to go to Ishgard, but, you know, Ishgard has always had their gates closed, like, why are they opening it up, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and it's it's to the point now where we finish this, it's like, alright, Sultana's gone, everybody thinks you, well, I shouldn't say everybody, right, because now that you've done the cutscenes, you can walk around town, and some people be like, I heard the Warrior of Light killed her, but that can't be true, like, he's the freaking Warrior of Light, like, why would he do that? 
and a lot of people think she's just sick. Yeah, yeah. Some people even, don't even, even know. the Sultan Swarm. Yeah, and and so you know, well, you know, as the warrior of light, you know what's up. You got framed for the murder, and it gets to the point where at the at the right at the end there, everyone's like, "All right, get the hell out of here! Like you're done. Like Ishgard's the only place you can go." And so, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later with the trailer. But yeah, it is. The now, end not, is very depressing. Now, not to uh, not to discard one dark steel foil hat theory to throw <laughs> out one that's equally unlikely. But um, the feeling I got from this whole thing was that a lot of the NPCs were saying there are darker machinations at work here. This is all part of a larger plan. And now we see that a lot of that has to do with Lolorito, especially in the trailer mm-hmm. this morning. It made it much more obvious that Lolorito was uh, the one coming out on top here. But they hint that this is a much bigger plan uh, oh, yeah. by people who are much better at causing chaos. And of course, that evokes the Asians. Yeah, and it's, um, it's interesting because that, that whole cutscene, right, the... With between uh, Rabon and um, Ilbert, right? They're fighting, yep. and then uh, Rabon just like loses it and just kills Taleji. And I'm just sitting there. I, I was like, that I was like clapping. Yeah, like just like it, his expression. He's like, oh, like his arms are like. He's like, <laughs> I like how they're. I like how they're trying to show that he's clearly, basically, just cut in half, scissors style. But they can't show too much right. on the game rating that they have. Um, but the thing Other, I noticed is <laughs> that um, the first time we come across an Asian, if you come from Ulda, uh, you know how you, you meet the, the Black Mask, one of the underlings in each of the mm-hmm. opening scenarios? When you first meet the one that's in Ulda, uh, he is shadowing Lolorito's men. And I could never figure mm-hmm. out why. Why does the Asian? Because... Uh, the way that scenario works is the Asian is messing with all of these factions in Thanalan, and he gets the Alacron to steal the Sultana's crown. Um, and as you're trying to get it back, you get caught up in this whole thing with mining rights, and after they go to kill you, the Asian comes out, and all of the brass blades that are there to kill you run away from the Asian, saying, is Lolorito going to kill us too? And I've always wondered what the hell's going on there, and now I'm mm-hmm. wondering... Could he be caught up in a larger Asian plan for yeah. that city? And it's interesting, right? Because this whole time, we're like, wow, like, Teleji's a dick. Like, it's all him. It's all Teleji. And then you kill Teleji, and Lodorito's just like, Lil' JK, it's all me. <laughs> it was me the whole time. I had a big sigh of relief when Raubon took him down, too, because I always thought Teleji was going to die, and I thought you were crazy for saying the Sultana was going to die. And if it was exactly the opposite, I was going to be like, damn it. <laughs> yeah it was it was really interesting to to see that um i'll be really curious to see where that goes i mean there's a million different plays that they could do now right um right. obviously there's 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 definitely the Asian connection um we know that teleji was working towards omega weapon is i mean presumably that's also you know lola rito's plan now um we know there was Ultima Weapon. We know the Empire was involved in that. Is the Empire involved somehow with them? I mean, like, you know, there's so many different things that they could weave into this that would totally fit. Um, I think they've done a good job between 1.0 and 2.0. Um, at first, I didn't think this was the case. I thought they were spoon feeding us info, but uh, 1.0 was very convoluted. I thought maybe yeah. they were overcompensating by making this too simple and spoon feeding a lot of the answers. But it turns out that uh, they give you just enough very clear information. To make pretty much anything possible for the future um and that i think is very skillful and i'm glad to see that because we can talk about things that have happened with a lot of clarity but it could go anywhere from here yeah and it's it's interesting now looking back at some stuff knowing what happened um you know you look back at um there was a a, a dialogue with with ilbert where he goes oh like i would never betray you like i'd cut off my arm before i do that and it's like what does he do to Ravon later? He cuts off his arm. That's um, one thing I, I picked up on rather recently is um, a lot of times Square Enix would give us uh, a foreshadowing that was very vague and then later we'd come back to it and understand it. But we have gone from vague foreshadowing to Square Enix outright lying to us. Yeah. Um, I was I was suspicious of Ilbert because of the quest where you um, start going after the Ivy. There's a journal entry uh, for a quest called Traitors in the Midst. 
And for Traitor in the midst, the image is Raubon in the background and Ilbert kind of looking suspiciously sideways at him. And that's when I started suspecting him. But I came off of that quite a bit when he started saying, there are lines you don't cross, you don't betray your friends. I would cut off my own arm before I would do that. And I kind of started going on to Yu Yu Hase, who was always talking about how he'd do anything for money or possibly Laurentis. Uh, who, I mean, sometimes you give people a second chance and they have a great turnaround and you're like, yeah, your character development. But sometimes you give someone a second chance and they're just an asshole. Yeah. Uh, Crystal so, Genesis in the chat makes a really good point. The arm that Robon lost was the one that he held Nanamo in. Oh. I had forgotten about that. And, and another kind of funny coincidence, too, uh, which is just so kind of silly and out there. Uh, Robon's triple triad card um his weak on the right side which if you court like where his the way his portrait is on the card it's totally the the arm that gets cut it's a two <laughs> i love the hints like that in the um in the triple triad cards that was brilliant yeah. foreshadowing right there um the the other one i really like is the tonberry it is incredibly weak from all angles but the doink zone it's two 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 seven mm-hmm but yeah, that was a very good piece of foreshadowing. Um, I'm 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 liking that they're willing to lie to us, though. Um, it was it was really easy to pick up on their foreshadowing beforehand. Well, and it's one of those things too. I mean, you know, especially now. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that you know try and dig for for information, right? Um, and so I'll be like, oh, like I wonder if this will happen. And you know, Square will be like, oh no, no, that's that's not going to happen. And then, like secretly they're like, crap, how did they figure? <laughs> like, how did they know that? <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll still call foul if the game mechanics lie to us again. But oh, other sure. characters lying to us, just blatantly mm-hmm. to our face, horrible lying to us. I'm okay with that. I think it's I think it's good that it's a little harder to pick up on the foreshadowing right now. Yeah. Um, kind of moving from there uh, as a launch point, the betrayals that we saw ended up being everybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I suspected Yu Yu Hase, I sp- suspected Laurentis, but everybody but the fourth, that was, that's a lot of people. It's, it was like, it reminded me kind of like of, of like Captain America Winter Soldier, right? Where it's like, oh, hey, by the way, like, ha- like most of, most of our organization is Hydra. Like, yay. <laughs> our bad. Yep. <laughs> Didn't see that one. I see you've built a grand company and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hope we can get real out of there. At least some of the more loyal people from the fourth. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things now where, um, you know, between, you know, the, the flames, the brass blades, you know, all the, the organizations in, in old on now you have the crystal braves. It's like, is there ever going to be a point where, especially for the Crystal Braves, where that gets rebuilt? Or is it pretty much just at the point now where Alpha is like, you know what, like, screw it. Like, I'm done trying to do that. I'm wondering if, if we're going to end up with an eventual unified force, but one that has nothing to do with that. Like, he'll, he'll get a, a second chance. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering after we after we clear up the Dragon Song War to the best of our ability, if Ishgard would be willing to kind of become the hub of the Alliance again. Well, you know what I I think would be interesting too, um, just the way that things have gone. Right, uh, we know the ri- Rising Stones are are pretty much taken. Right, we can't yep. get into the, and use those anymore. Um, but um, our buddy over over in Corthus there, uh, what was it, o- Ochfont or how do you I forget? Uh, you what- pronounce it Orshvon. Or it's fun. Okay, it's fun. so he, he basically comes. He's like, no, he's like, come on, like, come chill in his guard for a bit. You can call it the the, the what was it, the falling, the falling snows, snows or or some such. Um, and that right there, I mean, you know, we're talking about foreshadowing. Um, you know, get all the stuff with you know the Javanians cleared up. Get Ish guard kind of back in good standing, or don't. At this point, like nobody like wants to be buddies with Old Da, right? Um, and then just kind of buddy up with them and. You know what I mean? Like, I think it would be uh, probably the funniest thing because in 2010, 2011, when we first met Ishgard, the first thing I ever said about him was, "That's the bad guys." Uh, if you've ever <laughs> played Final, if you've ever played Final Fantasy, you know that the two biggest people that are most likely to be the bad guys are anybody who rules a big city and anybody who looks religious. Like, if you walk into Final Fantasy 13, mm-hmm. if it, 13, if you see um bartandalus for the first time you should know bad guy uh so well it's it's interesting too right looking at at final fantasy 11 
Um, and I think that's probably a really good comparison here is you have Juno. Juno is this se- exactly. central hub for everything. Uh, oh, by the way, the Archduke is part of this like ancient civilization, uh, and he kind of wants to like take over the world. So as and we say, know there's something going on with the bishop, the archbishop, because we've right, seen the Assians. the Assians with him, and that's 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 the only time we've seen him really. It's like, oh hey, here's here's the guy in charge of stuff in Ishgard. Oh by the way, the Assians, and that was like the end of the patch. Like just kind of here you go. Here's the scene. I've got to dig up the first time I said it, but that's exactly what I said. Was uh, this is this is Juno with a pope? They they can't mm-hmm. not be evil. Yeah. So I mean, if we can purge that in this patch and get Juno back, I think that would be great to have that as a hub. Which is you know again lending itself to kind of that really just kind of dark and depressing feeling. It's like all right, you got run out of Old Ah. The only place you can go now is being run by somebody that you know like not a good guy. That I don't, you know, I'm sure you'll you'll find that. Well, presumably, you know, you, you'll you'll find that out. But um, yeah, it's like this is it. This is this is where you got to be. So uh, deal with it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the whole thing. I mean, much oh, yeah. more, much more than I thought I was going to. I expected Ishgard to just kind of open in a patch and was like, there you go, there's your city. But no, this is much better. Yeah. The guy at the gaze of judgment was like, all right, you crazy adventurers, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because. Uh, we expected it to be open six months after the regular launch. We thought they were holding it back like airships, mm-hmm. and just f- years, nope. years of is it open? No, no, all right. no not yet. Oh, all right. So can I, can I can I target the, the? No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad they put it as a big theme of the expansion and gave us a lot of reasons to be excited for it. But yeah, it'd be it, cool to get the falling snows. It's it's interesting. I'll be, it'd be funny if they actually call it that. Um, but it's it's interesting because you have you know you have a realm reborn, um, and you have the three city states, and then you have Heaven's Word and you have Ishgard. Um, you know, you would think that okay maybe 4.0 has Alamigo then right or something like that. Um, but you go from having these three city, city states to um, what happens in Olza, um, and you got to wonder okay well what's the state of the alliance in now? Like do I even want to go to any of these city states? Um, Meryl Wib, uh, in particular, like I hate Limsa so much now because when all that stuff started going down, you know, Robin's fighting Ilbard, and she's just kind of standing there and her little like bodyguard dude's like, we should probably go. And she's like, all right. I have had the highest Lominson pride since this game started. I have always been Tell C Swallows All. And to know, like, I. Played 1.0. I saw her call BS every time she thought there was BS. I saw her take matters into her own hands. And I can see her not wanting to get involved in another state's politics. That's a no-no. I can see her not wanting to drag Limsa Laminsa into something it doesn't need to be in. That's a bad idea. But I cannot see her just keeping her mouth shut, turning around, and leaving while that was happening to me. And I'm, oh, I'm so let down. Yeah, I mean, like, Connie said, okay, I'll let that one slide. Just because yep. she's not a fighter, right? But and she, nothing she could say would add sucker to that situation. No, and she, you know, she's she's sitting there. She's you know, she's got her her staff. Like, what's she gonna do? Meryl Wibbs got her two guns, and we know we've seen her kick ass before in in some of the the two point two stuff. So it's like, what? You're just you're just you're gonna you're gonna okay. See you later. Maybe I could I could forgive her for not blowing anybody away, or I could forgive her for not even drawing the pistols. But on the way out the door, at least say like, I'm not gonna stand for this. This is a farce. I'm out of here. Like yeah, she and and you know, Robin sitting there we're like missing an arm, and she doesn't even like look at him and be like, yo, like I got you. Like don't worry. I'm just taking yeah, a breather. The- I'll be. Ba-. You know, it would be kind of redeeming. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know fix the fact that wow like that whole scene you're just like wow screw you Meryl Webb uh, if she breaks Robon out that right because be cool. he's he's in jail without an arm there's there's <laughs> plenty of time there's plenty of time for redemption mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. uh I've got the officer coat folded up under the bed right now but we'll we'll see if I can wear it again <laughs> right someday it could it could be worse you could be with the flames <laughs> uh, I mean at least you've got Robon to be proud of I, he did, he did good yeah, there. But he's in jail and missing an arm, dude. I got my yeah. my old uh, rite of passage hanging up on my wall above <laughs> my computer. I'm just looking at it now, like, oh my god, like why why did I sign up with them? Uh, it's crazy, and it's I'll be really curious to see, um, 
how or even if if they resolve some of the stuff and and you know how long that takes and i mean it could be something that goes on for you know a couple different expansions right yeah well i mean speaking of the expansions i'm, I'm you can always see mirrors of 11 here um you got the same five races basically with the different lore you got the three city states be it with a different lore you got your central hub i mean and now we're going to sky and they were discussing possibly going to sea so i'm expecting that one of the patches is going to be all zabi except it's going to be thavnir which we know is uh uh near eastern um mm-hmm. Based on Ottomans, usually the Ottoman Empire. Um, so we might have an Al Zabi coming in. Um, then we've also got mentions of the Far East. We don't know if we're going there. Um, oh, we never go. We never go to Far East in, in Final Fantasy MMOs. Yeah, I, I, I tend to imagine that they keep the Asian culture separate because it's a Japanese game. We'll, we'll go to the Near East, and then the map for that will just kind of get cut down the middle, and we'll never know what's on the other side of that. So I'm expecting Thavnir uh, and the Reclamation of Alamigo. Those are the two I'm expecting mm-hmm. the biggest ones. Possibly Alamigo first, because um, I don't know how many people follow it this closely enough to pick up on it, but the Eorzean Alliance was actually formed the first time around by Ishgard to fight Alamigo. Yeah. Uh, Alamigo was was uh, waging war against Gridania, the Autumn War, and Ishgard knew if it fell, the Alamigans, the best, strongest city-state, were going to be right on their doorstep. So Ishgard rallied up Limsa Lamensa and Ulda and joined Gridania to throw back Alamigo. And it's, I think it would be really cool to see it come full circle with we solve Ishgard's problems, Ishgard rejoins the Alliance, we force Ulda back into compliance, and then march on Alamigo. Mm-hmm. So I can see that happening before we go to the um, the Near East. But the thing is, that leaves out Chains of Permathia. Uh, and where could we go that's back in time or forward in time? Uh, and I'm wondering if that's mm. why they will never talk to me about the uh, Fifth Astral Era War of the Magi. Well, and, that's my and, big you know, fridge theory right now. You know, you talk about that. Um, and maybe, maybe we don't necessarily have to go to a specific location, right? Because we have, uh, you know, the echo, right? We, they can tell right. those stories um, through that. So, you know, we, we don't necessarily need a, a Wings of the Goddess expansion where we just, you know, we go back, you know, 20-something years ago and just, you know, relive something. Um, they can just be like, all right, here's a cut scene with the echo. This is what I'm happened. Just- I'm very, very suspicious that they mention the War of the Magi in the Fifth Astral Era over and over, and we'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, it's great. We'd like to know more about that." They're like, "No, we're actually, <laughs> we're actually going to shut that right down. We're not going to talk about mm-hmm. that at all." <laughs> so I'm, I've, I've got high hopes and paranoia, lots of paranoia. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, what's up? Uh, did we talk about the Asians? We did not yet. Let's talk about the Asians. We dabbled. Let's let's a little, a little bit. more. Yeah. Let's get a little more let's into the Asians. Launch off from the the final scene. Um, the mm. final scene after the credits, we see La Habrea and Elidibus, Uh The two that we know are are not with the main Asian group. They're from our world, so to speak. Um, they seem to be a little more in cahoots than the last time we caught up with them, but La Habrea is completely distracted. He uh, he started off with, well, Zodiac coming back is going to require chaos. I say we use the primals. That'll, that'll cause some chaos. And now he's he's very obsessed with that, that side project. Everything mm-hmm. always comes back to the primals for him and wanting to put the power of gods in the hands of man. And it's because he, he needs that, that flow of aether. I have no idea what's going on with that. Um, yeah. It It is so wide open that any theory could work, down to the idea of them bringing back Zodiac to burn out Hydaelyn and then taking the power of the gods and putting it into the hands of man and having the man-made gods strike down Zodiac and then we're free of the cycle of the eras. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really liked seeing uh, Elidibus kind of chew out La Habrea for letting his pet project take priority over Zodiac's will. I thought that was a very subtle, clever scene. Yeah, Elidibus is a really interesting character because, um, you know, he'll he'll come in, he's like, hey guys, like, what's up, Scions? How you doing? Just, just want to, you know, come and chat. And then, you know, <laughs> on the other hand, he's, you know, smack around, smacking around La Habrea, like, you know, get your stuff together. Like, what are you he doing? Can, he confuses me. Um, one of the things I like to do is I like to read the other languages, particularly German and French. Um, 
they're not very big on subtlety in those languages. Yeah. Uh, English English likes to lead us around, but in in those they have people say things even if it's out of character. Uh, for example, in you know remember when you meet La Habrea and Todorok, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Oh, you're getting too powerful. I can't let you get in my way. I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to burn the crystal." Um, in the middle of that speech, in the other languages I found out, he actually takes a moment to let you know how your powers work. Hmm. And then, like, I can't let you learn how to stop me, but by the way, did you know that you can interact with the ethereal realm to manifest crystals of life? He, like, pipes, pops out like an instruction book. Now I have to kill you. The um, echo in you. <laughs> yeah. So, in in those languages, Elidibus very specifically comes off as, I am not your enemy. I am not like the Dark Princes. I just want to put this world back on the right track. And I mean, if you read English, you can see him saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. But just not as blatantly, I am not your enemy. Um, And that I'm very interested in. Because it kind of feels like you're my enemy. (laughs) How can he not be our enemy and be all about Zodiac's will down to the point that he is the 13th, the Serpentarius, the um, the final constellation, which is, you know, and it's it's interesting going back a little bit. um, It reminds me of Gaius a little bit. Yep. You know, it's just like, you know. It's like we're chill, like we're just trying to get rid of primals. We don't like primals. His, like you guys are good, like if you don't get in our way. Like, his own will. It's not he doesn't have a side. He is a side. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm wondering Maybe if- maybe Gaius you ready for this? Maybe Gaius is a little Because isn't <laughs> he from our realm? He didn't mm. show up he didn't show up until after. Mm. That would be oh, that would be freaking weird. That's well, I mean, how did he meet La Habrea? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. In one of the scenes, Elidibus flat out says that he was here a couple thousand years ago. So, uh, hmm. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, uh, I got this plan, right? I'll just, I'll be this, like, the, you know, this, this father figure to this engineer dude, and he'll make some stuff. And it'll, it'll just, just trust me, it'll all, it'll all work out. You do your primal thing. I'll be over here, playing playing with this kid named Sid, and we'll just we'll just see what happens. But I just I I'm really excited to figure out whether there is some very big intricate plan to kind of turn everything all around, or if Elidibus is just the great deceiver. Like if everything he said was a flat out lie, and he's just trying to stir the pot a little more. Yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens because. There, you know, and again, there are so many different storylines weaving in and out of just everything. You have the Asians, you have Ishgard and the Dravadians, you have the Empire, you have the Primals, and it's just you know little little you know victories and losses here and there. And then, yeah, I mean, there's so much, so many different things that could happen. Um, and to you know give us as much information as they do, while still being able to surprise us with stuff like hey, like. Hope you didn't like Nanamo too much, because <laughs> and she's gone. <laughs> yeah, they should. Uh, the uh, the portraits in the uh, that you buy for with uh, your grand company seals should have they should have gone like on sale. I can see people buying one to make a Nanamo shrine. I to- I totally picked one up after that kind of thing. I'm like, you know what? I didn't make a shrine, but I had the I had the Raoban and, and Nanamo portrait. But I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go buy that uh, that Nanamo one. I'm just glad it put Iceheart in perspective a little bit. Um, mm. I mean, we we had our we had our suspicions that she was the result of Asian meddling, but she was so much closer to the dragons that it seemed a little open. Yeah. Um, but in two point three, they're like, we're gonna go north and and sow the divine seeds into the fertile soil of belief and blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden, Iceheart pops up, and she's got a beast beneath the right and God, uh, power of gods in the hands of man. Yeah. And then, I mean, as soon as you strike her down, she gets an extreme mode, and that's always tied into the Asians. So yeah. I definitely think she's at least partly a, pl- a pawn in their game. I was thinking in this patch we'd see like a "What have I done?" moment, but no, we didn't get that at all. She's, uh, she's yeah, right I'll be track. really curious. I mean, obviously she's gonna she's gonna have a part to play uh, in Heaven's Word, um, and that'll be really interesting, I think, to to see, especially because I mean, you look at. Um, the primals, as as the the patches have come out, um, the primals have 
changed, right? Like, it's like, oh, it's like Beastmen and Crystals and Extremes come out. And it's like, oh, it's like Crystals and Sacrifices. And then it's like, okay, Rama's like, he's just like, a, he's a cool dude. If we don't piss him off, like, that's that's cool. Like, word up, Beard, Beard Man. And then, you know, Shiva comes out and it's like a weird, like, manifestation thing. And she, like, did it with a dragon. And it's, you know, it's like every primal keeps changing and it's i'll be curious to see with um you know ravana and bismarck like if if they fall under that kind of older idea of okay it's you know beast minute crystals or if there's something else at play um because you know that whole thing with primals has been changed you know once we think we have an idea of how you know primals work and everything they throw a curveball at us Um, every every patch i have to revise pretty much every theory i have for it um, believe it or not, the biggest wrench in the whole system is an ice heart for me. It's Ramu mm. because after he dies, he comes back and talks to you. Um, that's very strange to me because uh, up until then we, uh, we thought they were basically overpowered elementals. And all of a sudden now we've got a, um, a soul orb, basically kind of like the ones we've seen so far showing up and talking to you. And then we hear about the soul of St. Shiva. It's like, what's going on here? I thought it was just, you know, the essence of the land combining with ether and prayer. Um, and now we're going to meet two entirely new primals. Well, and it's, it's interesting, right? You, you know, you talk about the, the souls and, you know, the ether of the land and that kind of thing. And that, that was something we had talked about, um, I think, during our, our first lore cast. That was one of our first lore yep. craft pieces is, um, are the primals entities that exist within the ether? Or are they just manifested uh, based on preconceptions that the beast tribes have uh i remember you know, what uh, effort is we were trying to figure out what the essence truly was yeah was, yeah, was, was there an, was there an essence beyond the um the associations philosophically with the ether itself uh to give an example uh ramu is extremely wise um now that could be because there is some lingering personality uh, or or information in the ether or in the lightning aspected uh, side of the land's existence or it could be a soul that has existed for a very long time and has been corrupted by this ritual or it could just be that lightning is always associated with wisdom because lightning uh, like a storm is quiet for a moment and then all of a sudden swiftly strikes that's why uh purple is associated with lightning is associated with dexterity so maybe he's just wise because they're summoning lightning it's it's really really hard to put together um the best theory i've got right now is that they used to be mortal souls and now we're calling back the mortal souls and using them as a vessel to stuff them with the essence of the land and it takes the shape of whatever your prayers were for but then i mean one look at ravana or bismarck and this whole thing could crumble yeah I'm yeah. thinking I'm thinking the idea is that the original primals used the essence of the land because the ether was still somewhat in balance or somewhat in balance. And then once it was imbalanced even further, you could summon pretty much anything you wanted to. And that started around with Mogul, who was very weak at the time. He wasn't as strong as the other primals. But now that the ether is extremely out of balance, perhaps Bismarck and Ravana can be summoned, even though they're not from the essence of the land but i mean all they need to do is say oh these these guys have been around the entire time and now sure. it falls apart <laughs> so we have to, we have so much to learn from those two before i can even begin to comment anymore yeah but if we're going to talk about the Asians and the last scene we have to talk about the very last thing we saw which is yuri uh, Uriange speaking with elitibus Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people expected to see him turning up there. And no, it's nice to see them capitalizing on his awkwardness again. Remember, for a while in one point, we thought he was evil too. Yeah, now, I remember that back back when they they had the uh, the events leading up to the, the story bit. We're like, oh, who's this Archon guy? Like, he's up to no good. Because uh, when when Orange first showed up, he was a GM controlled player, and he yeah. would cast cast stuff on you and shout about the end of the world, and then he disappeared. And we started doing these quests about meeting him. And there were rumors that he was part of a dark mage cult that lived immortally and wanted to sell Eorzean souls to the demon lords of the seven hells. And everybody's like, oh, oh, could that be it? Could he be a bad guy? Could he be that old? Could he be immortal? Uh, It seems like that was just a uh, kind of hint about the Asians now. Mm. Um, But 
as I was thinking too, um, you know, we talk about what if, because he was, you know, he had that kind of, oh, he's evil in 1.0. And then he's just kind of there. He's just like this, this smart dude who sounds like Balthier, right? In, yep. in A Realm Reborn. <laughs> and then you hit, you hit 2.4 and Moonbrita comes in and humanizes him a little bit, right? Like, the, yep. you know, she talks like they used to fool around back in the day. And he's just kind of like, no, nah, like, I, no, like, don't, don't <laughs> listen to her. Um, and then they kill her. And then with this, it's like, oh, yeah, is okay. that is that what has finally pushed him over an edge? It's you know, it's it's interesting. We talk about you know, like they they warm you up to Tatru. Okay, well, what's going to happen to her? And so they humanize Urianje. Not to say that he hasn't been humanized a little bit. Like I mean, he has a personality and stuff, but he's fairly like like cardboardy, right? He's just you know right. he talks in the old English and he's just kind of like information. Here you go, and they start to humanize him a little bit, and then they flip it around and say, oh, by the way, he's also with the Asians. Like what? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to shut down good speculation ever. Um, but I think it might be a red herring. I mean, we thought he was, he, we thought he was evil in 1.0 because of all the rumors circulating about him, and then we learn that um, he's just awkward and mm-hmm. being cryptic and awkward. They thought he would be the perfect distraction to teleport around, distracting Nail Von Darnus while they reestablished the Grand Companies to buy us some time. So he was the perfect. Uh, distraction for the empire and when you finally meet louis zwa he's like oh yeah sorry about uh sorry about Rianje. he's he's just read more old tomes than talk to modern people and uh you know we see him again getting a little more humanized but then all of a sudden turns up i have answered thy summons to the uh to elitabus mm-hmm. and i think we're meant to ask did he finally get pushed over the edge? Has he been evil, et cetera, et cetera? But I think what's going on is just that we've finally gotten to the point in Elidibus's plan where he can start involving uh, certain people from this realm and that he thinks Uriange is a good choice. And Uriange, knowing the history of the Asians and knowing that the, um, the messenger, the uh, advocate, is different from the others, thought mm-hmm. this invitation might be worth something. So why is he going to meet them? And on that note, too, I mean, you know, Uri Anjay, he was the first Archon we knew of. Right. Um, and what do we know about the Archons? They they foretell the, you know, the, the comings of the, the Astral and the Umbral eras. They understand, you know, that balance, right, that they want to kind of set the world back into. Um, and I think, yeah, like from that, you know, looking at it that way, yeah, he is the perfect choice to, to bring in to if they, you know, want to talk a little bit more about that. But I, I don't want to make it sound like any of my predictions are more likely to come true because no, I mean, only only mine come true. Yeah, that seems <laughs> it seems to be the case. Um, I'm I'm pretty good at getting all the information together. I'm pretty good at connecting the information that's out. But I have a horrible record of predicting the future. Horrible. <laughs> I got lucky. Maybe we'll see. Um, actually, I did I did predict some trailer stuff too. Once 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 we start talking about that, funny enough. Um, all right. Uh, so Midgard Sormer, um, he was with uh, the first part of two point five. Yeah. Uh, um, and it was one of those things where you know the trailer comes out. It's like, yeah, you're going to to the Agrius, the Keeper of the Lake, um, and you're gonna fight Midgard Sormer. You know, and coming from one point you're like, oh yeah, like I remember. Wait, he died. <laughs> like, how, what is, what is happening? And you get up there, and he basically takes away Heidelin's gift. He does. Didn't see that one coming. Um, you know, we saw in the trailer that like something happens, a beam of light gets shot in you, but you know, and then we you play it, and you're like, whoa, like, okay, now what? <laughs> this is this is one of those scenes that caused a lot more chaos than I think Square Enix anticipated. Um, he was in the opening movie for 1.0, and we know that they were moving towards opening Ishgard before everything got shaken up, and and Yoshida became director producer, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I imagine that bringing him back was something that was supposed to happen three years ago. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't happen. And again, in the, um, in the Japanese speech, he tells you all sorts of stuff for no real good reason. Um, like, I think you're an ant, you're unworthy of Heidelin's power, now sit there while I talk to you about everything that's been going on and why I feel this way. Yeah. So uh, 
they kind of made him much more vague in English, and that caused a bit of backlash, which I thought was surprising. There was it a was, lot. Of people yeah, who I mean, there were. It was. It's funny because we talk about going back and looking at other languages for for some stuff, but um, people were tearing this whole Midgard Stormer dialogue apart in all the languages, and people saying, "Oh, he's not specific enough," and blah 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 blah. Um, you know, he he mentions like something along the lines of oh like you know something's off in Ishgard and people are like I don't know what he's talking about blah 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 I'm like did you did you did you skip your cutscenes did that you was, not see the Essenes behind the Archbishop that was one of my favorite lines like if if he doesn't tell us the whole story how do we know something's hinky in Ishgard uh, by I watching the cutscenes and like thought reading La, thought La Habre and Elizabeth standing next to the throne was a clue but yeah, I mean it's it's funny because that that whole thing came out and and. Slightly before that, people were talking about how they were irritated with the way Arianje talked and the you know the old English and stuff. And my my only thought was these people need to go back to complaining about the quality of the grass, right? It's like there's <laughs> there's always like that group of people. They'll find something that they don't like and they'll just go crazy about it. I hesitate um, to even bring it back up because they finally died down about it. But <laughs> I I thought it was really funny that um, all right Arianje talks the way he does because he reads old books all day. Yeah. He doesn't like he doesn't interact in modern language with modern people. He only reads out of date grammar and books. So he talks weird. That makes sense. The the dragons sleep for hundreds of years at a time and barely interact with us and have their own language. So of course they're going to use old school patterns. They haven't picked up on our modern colloquialisms yet. That all makes sense. But I mean, for the people who can't read that and and have a hard time understanding it, to have the 2.5 trailer be uh, Orianger back to back with Midgard somewhere that's just gonna like make some people snap so mm -hmm. I think that's where that came from but the um I can see the I can see both sides of the the argument about Midgard Zormer's localization. I don't think he would explain to you everything in the world when he thinks you're an ant who's unworthy of the power you even have at the moment mm -hmm. but but I mean it's valuable information and like like we we we've joked around too. Uh, basically, Midgard Zormer. The only reason he's there is just to sass you, yeah. right? He just pops up, especially now that he's a he's a little like minion that he'll he'll just pop in and out of cutscenes. He's basically like the new the new Heidelin, right? For for three is basically how they set it up. Where uh, there was some kind of pact, he basically became reborn from taking Heidelin's blessing from you. All the you know the crystals that you you know kept in your little weird dark crystally room inside your head or something are gone, and now he's a little baby dragon. Um, I think the big current thought is he's going to be that dragon mount that you end up getting yep. in Heaven's Word, you know, the, the Collector's Edition statue. I'd, I'd be very surprised if that wasn't Midgard. It's one of those things where it's like, all right, just just say he's Midgard Swarmer. It's like well, we know. <laughs> when you and I were when you and I were at Fan Fest, he was like, "There's going to be a dragon, but we can't talk about you know who he is." And we like lean into each other, Midgard Swarmer. So they're like, yes, yeah. so they're like, so Midgard Swarmer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think. The minion is just a foreshadow of he's going to be the yeah. flying dragon that that's with you. But I mean, a lot of people thought maybe he's supposed to be our protector now, but he didn't. He didn't step in at all. He's just stood on the sidelines. He's kind of like there, and and it's it's interesting too the way that you know you have her realm reborn and you have Heidel and then she's like, all right, like here's Ultima weapon and you can't hurt him right now. Like let me let me you know snap my fingers, you know I'll shine a bright light and you can hit him and. And now you get to, uh, you know, Midgard Stormer and, and Heaven's Word, and it's just like, all right, it's dark. You don't have, like, this magic protection. Like, you're on your own. Like, it's pretty much your strength, and that's it. That's what that's what you have. I loved uh, his reaction. Like, he knows you have the echo, and he, he thinks that you're on the wrong side of this whole thing, so he goes to strike you down. And Heidelin intervenes and deflects the blast, and he's just mm -hmm. like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. This... Ant is your chosen. So now he knows he's bound to us by whatever this this covenant is. Um, but he's he's not happy about it at all and just wants to see that you can stand on your own if he's going to do anything for you, which I imagine he will if you're riding around on his back in Heaven's mm -hmm. Word. There's got to be some kind of turning point there. We have uh, Rahalus Rulesis. I'm sorry, I'm butchering names today. Uh, in the chat says, the two dragons look completely different, though. Yes. But you consider you go from a giant Midgard Swarmer to a little baby Midgard Swarmer. Um, yeah, they have he's entirely gonna, different anatomy between... He's, yeah, the, he's um, going to grow up. Between between the worm that you see in the 1.0 uh, opening, he's, yeah. he's very much like the uh, Chinese dragons, mostly very long body twirling around. 
and the very big wings. But even even just moving from that to the minion is totally different uh, anatomy because he's got you know he's a four legged two wing dragon like the others now. Um, for me, it's all about the face. I mean, they might be different dragons. I don't want to want to be oh, like, sure. no, I'm right. Blah, blah, blah. But I mean, um, but it's for me. It's the face. Sormer. For me, it's the face. <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks just like his face. But I agree that the the body anatomy is absolutely different. Yeah, but um, I do see that in the minion as well. No, oh, definitely. And I, and you think about like Heaven's Word and and the mount, and it's like it's just it's. Just, dragon his name is bob and you meet him in the like now like it's it's gonna be a, a really important character it's you know they've already kind of shown you um midgard stormer kind of being reborn he's obviously gonna be you know the new voice in your head kind of thing um and so that's it's watch opening yeah. opening cutscene flying to the uh to the flying continent it's gonna be midgard stormer as the little minion sassing you as you're riding your new friend vertra Okay. You're gonna have to load this back up. Like, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's like it's like one of one of his uh, seven sons, right? You just you just run into him. Hey, by the way, can you let this dude just like fly you around? Like, I, I made this deal with this this crystal thing, and I just I, it would help me a lot. <laughs> Grandpa, no. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's interesting that whole scene with with Midgard Swarmer, how he he just kind of strips you of the blessing, not the echo, right? It's the blessing. It's just the blessing. Um, we had a hard time differentiating the two for a little while because they also referred to the Echo as Hydaelyn's blessing. Not the blessing of light, but just a blessing from Hydaelyn. It was it was kind of confusing, but the way it works is there's the Echo, which a lot of people have, um, and that prevents you from getting tempered. It, it transcends the boundaries of the soul and, and lets you interact with the souls of others. It lets you see their memories. Uh, we see with the Sahagin that it might actually allow you to transcend the flesh entirely. It might be the basis of how some of these entities in the game have come about. But the Blessing of Light is very different. Um, La Habrea hasn't seen a Warrior of Light in a very long time, and that's why he's, he's very interested in you in particular. Uh, this is the glyph that you see in the visions. Um, this is pretty much the Blessing of Light. And when you collect the Crystals of Light, which is manifesting the... Um, manifesting them from the ethereal realm they basically power up the glyph and interact with each other to allow heidelin's light to shine through into our world and that's what we've lost we've lost the ability to, ability to tap her for defense and offensive power uh we still can resist primals but the blessing is gone um uh, mm -hmm. midgard somewhere says that he's he's taken it in english but he uses the word sealed in another language i forget which one it is uh, I think in Japanese too, but um, he darkened the crystals and yeah. took away our ability to manifest them. But uh, he, I, I don't think it means they're shattered or anything. I think he just uh, took our ability to manifest them and use them and darkened them. So we, we've lost the crystals of light. We haven't lost Heidelin's blessing. It's just been blocked. Yeah, which is which is interesting because um, and, and we don't hear from Heidelin, right? It's We have the the ending cutscene for for 2.0 you know you do your the y'all fly around the the crystal and whatever and then we don't really hear anything from her no she um, goes silent until she tells Minfilia to do what yeah, she to do which was really weird right because it's like you know we we thought she was gone at this point you know midgard summer kind of strips us of the blessing there's some kind of pact and he's he's basically our new chaperone and then you're running out of Volda and Minfilia's like oh what's that Heidelin? Oh, I have to stay here. Okay, I'll see you later, Warrior of Light. And you're just kind of like, but, but I, I didn't hear her. Like, what? Why won't she talk to me? <laughs> like, what and happened? My, my theory on this whole thing is that, um, because of the foreshadowing of Tataru and her always come home pendants, that um, Hyland was basically telling Minfilia that if she keeps running, they're all going to die, and that she needs to stop and take care of this and let the Warrior of Light go. Um, I think we might get the Scions back at some point in the story based on her going back for them. Mm -hmm. That's because she's sense. so useful. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing I, I couldn't wrap my head around was like every time we've seen her get into any kind of physical altercation, she's on the ground before the fight even starts. So uh, she has been getting stronger with the echo that might be recent or that might be useful to the recently dead and dying. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe they 
maybe the brass blades already turned around and went back the way they came by then. Maybe maybe she picked up a couple things about necromancy. And, or, uh, <laughs> for all we know, maybe she's going to actually have some offensive power in Heaven's Word. Yeah. No one would see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody would. Like, she's oh. I won't. I don't want to detract from her skills as a manager. I feel that good managers are often often overlooked and denied their credit. She's been a great manager for all of 2.0, but not so useful on the battlefield. No, not so much. All right. I think that's it for. Is there anything else we're missing from well, 2.5? We, no, not from this patch. Um, I think we I think we connected everything from this patch that we can to things that were in other patches. I'm, I'm trying to brainstorm and think about every anything we might have missed, but it's it's a lot of stuff that we can't say anything more than lore crafting about until we get some information in Heaven's Word. There are some really great theories out there that are being built around the recent information we've gotten, but it's not strong enough canonically to talk mm. about right now. I'd say. I mean, not on not on one of these. Um, lore casts at least on a, right perhaps a uh a different version of this kind of cast <laughs> <laughs> hint hint right um all right so today uh earlier this morning um they released the opening cinematic for heaven's word um we finally got to see the full thing um and it was interesting because we talked about this last week um about you know oh like what might be in it and um i think one of the things i you know we talked about the sultana being in it um and i think i i actually linked i think to to i don't know if he's you or somebody else actually linked the uh the scene from the the end of star wars episode three where they have the the funeral for uh for uh what's her name uh um, padme padme yeah and i'm like i'm like was, that that'll was, be in it was hez kessler havoc <clears throat> yeah yeah, Havoc's so, been hanging around a lot lately, so Havoc's got in on a lot of these good yeah, discussions. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, they should totally like, you know, do a funeral scene, interlace that with you like walking through the snow, blah blah blah. And sure enough, the trailer hits, and it's like, all right, like walking and running, and here's Nanamo drinking and dying, and you know, I'm like, I was secretly hoping, <laughs> I was secretly hoping that that was going to be in the patch or that was in the trailer. Sorry for all of the mm-hmm. people who were, who were saying she was still alive. Because, I mean, going back on the ending of the story, fine. TV shows yeah. do that all the time. It's cheap. It makes death cheap. Death should be expensive. But whatever, it happens all the time. Um, so she very well could be alive. But now you've not only exploited the emotion in the tra- and in the uh, ending, but it's a plot point in your trailer. And I, I'd like to believe that that's a little more solid. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they went over to visual works and they're like, hey, show her dying in fancy looking CG. Like that's probably a pretty safe bet that, <laughs> you know, Oh, we did forget to talk about one, one interesting theory. Oh, I just got a, I just got a message from Hez. Um, Pippin. We had, Oh yeah. Pippin. We had Pippin around. I can't believe I almost left. I kind of, it was funny. I kind of laughed. He's like, Oh, Pippin. I'm like a little Lalafell named after a thing that I remember as a hobbit. Like, all right, nice, nicely done. Um, interesting though um we've heard about him before we did in tales from the calamity yeah and it's it's like my, my girlfriend like knew that or, or she found it or something she's like oh yeah like he was that one thing i was like the, the what and i yep. went back and i was like oh they wow. foreshadowed they foreshadowed his arrival pretty subtly but i mean i, I did expect to meet him someday i could but see him like leading like some kind of mission into there's a there's a there's a theory floating around right now about why they chose that name. There, uh, I don't know if you know much about musicals. <laughs> not, but, not so uh, much. <laughs> Pip- Pippin is the name of a musical revolving around uh, Charlemagne and the nobility, and uh, he's a prince. Mm, and a lot, of people, a lot of people see the idea of like a prince showing up at Uldah right after the Sultana dies as suspicious as seeing Arthur show up at a time when you're talking about who the true, who the true King might be. It's a, it's yeah. a very strange name to see. And there are some theories floating around that Raubon might've adopted him to kind of, uh, pull a game of Thrones, unconfirmed theory out there, pull a Jon Snow, that it might be there an important go. Royal yeah. figure that, that, that could that become could a be. value later. So yeah, I think it's I think it's important to mention that before we get out of here. Yeah, that's no, that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, so I mean, obviously he's he's one of the the, the the few people that you 
you have <laughs> now. I mean, it's it's down to you know the Warrior of Light, Pippin, uh, Tataru, and uh, Alphino with with Urianje just still in the waking sands because quests. Um. <laughs> I I loved the um, the visuals they went with. He looks with the bull like the bullhorn helmet and the the Fabio hair. Yeah, Pippin looks fantastic. Yeah, he's def- he's definitely going to be a, an important part. And it's interesting too now with Heaven's Word, we go to the trailer um, and they show, you know, you're going through the snow. You, and I loved the um, just the, the look of it, right? You know, you see the Warrior of Light in that that cloak running around an old dot trying to get out of town. Um, you know, cut with um, the fight between, you know, Robon getting his arm knocked off and, uh, and the Sultana, you know, falling on the ground and, and drinking and- the poison. And in that scene, I did happen to notice that the Midlanders' facial expressions did not vary very much and were entirely appropriate. Don't think I didn't notice that. (laughs) (laughs) I like to to think Visual Works has noticed the conversations about the rapidly changing, easily confused facial expressions and everybody calling him Derplander. And they're like, no more. Yes, this is a darker Final Fantasy. He is pissed at everything. I, Uh. I I did notice that if anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's interesting as as the the scene pans out, right? You're walking through, and there was a there was a thread on on Reddit um, a couple weeks ago, I think, af- right after the patch, um, kind of talking about well, like wow, like that teaser that we had for Heaven's Word makes so much sense now. You're walking through the snow, you're alone, you've been, you know, just kind of shunned away from everything, and your only option now is to go north and Ishgard. Um and that's definitely the big the big theme about this whole trailer is how you're just. You know, you get kicked out. You're wanted to, you know, for for murdering the Sultana. You don't have any friends, and well, that's well, you do, but right, like the the way that the trailer plays out is like you're you're all alone, and you're just you're going up here. The part that, oh, oh god. god, no god, uh, <laughs> the part you, that made me laugh. You go, no, you go. It's like we're at a stoplight. <laughs> um, the the part that made me laugh was that he had bravura. Mm-hmm. Uh, he forgot it at Cartanau. Got it back from the Calamity Salvager after he got to 2.0. Yeah. And now he's he's just setting it down again. Got it back for nothing. Setting it down, picking up the uh, picking up the guy bowl. It's, well, it's not a he doesn't pick up a guy bowl. No, he's got the he's got the new one. Whatever whatever that new thing. You know that you know that there's like some Ishgardian knight like walking around walking into the arm or you going, That's a nice axe. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna use that. That should be a that should be a quest line. Some Ishgardian dude stole stole somebody's uh, Rivera, and you got to go get it back. By the end uh, of the by the end of the game, we'll have to make a wiki article for the journey of the axe. Yeah, right. Um, but it's it's interesting too because as you know, you go to Ishgard, you see you know you get attacked by the dragons, all the dragoons come out, which is freaking awesome. Yeah, that was uh, a good scene. And then you you see, um, like one right after the other, you see. Um, Sid flying through the air, you know, he's in the Enterprise kind of flying, you know, it's all nice and cloudy and then it gets like really dark and starts storming and the dragons are coming in. The airship, um, the Enterprise is, is, has changed a little bit too. Um, it's, it's a little thing. It's kind of hard to tell um, what they might be, but it looks like it's definitely like, you know, it's got some like weaponry maybe on it. There looks like there's like a cannon underneath or something now. Um, but it's, you know, it's storming and then it pans right away over to Old Da. Where it's also stormy and there's thunder and stuff, and then you see, you know, Lola Rito uh, and his his buddies, and it flashes back to Robon, um, and we see Robon twice in his cell in this trailer, um, and the second time he's he's been there a while, and I'm curious, um, you know, where that that time span is. Like, is it right after we leave, and this is just showing him later, or is this like a hint that he's gonna be there a while? It all depends on how long it takes him to grow a beard. I'd need to see his five o'clock shadow <laughs> before I could make any any judgments right. about that. I mean, for all I for all I know, he shaves every morning, and by the end of the night, he's just kind of like grizzly. So, I mean, he might have been there for maybe two maybe days. maybe he shaved with his left hand. <laughs> That's <laughs> awful. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for all I know, they could move the time bubble on us. I mean, they mm-hmm. might, probably not. They never did in eleven. But yeah. Or, or, you know, maybe maybe it's it's foreshadowing, too, where, you know, it's like, okay, he's in here, he's, you know, he's getting all all scruffy looking, and maybe we don't even, maybe he's just there for 3.0. Maybe we hear yeah. a couple things, and maybe he's just he's just in, in jail. 
I, I had this whole thing about maybe him and Ilbert were going to we're going to walk the streets of Alamigo together. But uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but maybe maybe he'll still be out in time for the reclamation. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um, I mean, we know that all of the story arcs from 2.0 are going to carry into Heaven's Word, right? You know, the Empire, the primals, um, you know, all that stuff. But um, just because they will continue in 3.0 doesn't mean that they're going to be constantly there, right? right. I mean, and it's like talking about, you know, the Asians and, and all these other things in 2.0. You know, they'll kind of pop up, fade away, pop up, fade away. And I think that's probably what's going to happen again in, in 3.0 where, you know, they'll start off they'll be like, ah, oh, dragons and stuff. And, okay, you beat, like, the main scenario for 3.0. And then it's going to be like, oh, like, so, hey, remember Robon? Next patch. Oh, hey, Asian. You know, like, I, th- I feel like it's probably going to do something like that again. Now uh, that we now that we know how Square Enix works, I'm actually looking forward to doing one of these bigger, like hour and a half, two hour lore casts uh, and a story so far progression for each patch. I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, is that a, is that a thing we're gonna do? I want to. I mean, I I you saw how long it took me to do this story so far, two point one to two point four, yeah. or two point zero to two point four in one sitting. I'd 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 rather just do one every patch. I don't know. What do you what do you guys what do you guys think of the chat? You guys want to see? Uh... Thorcast for each patch just to talk about everything, all spoilers and, and all that stuff. I think that'd be fun. I'd do it. I think it would Well, I, I'd hope so. I'm not doing it by myself. <laughs> It'd be boring. I'd just be sitting here. So, yeah, like this old Tana died and I got framed for it and I was kind of sad. Trailer's cool. See you next time. Like, you know, like it's weird talking to myself. So, I think, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll do that. Tw- twist their arms, right? It's like we don't want no, we don't, we don't, we don't want a new lore cast. Why would we want new lore casts? It's only our favorite podcast in the whole wide world. I've been getting a lot of requests for that lately, anyway. But, oh. but we might yeah. be able to to yeah, do figure some, we'll work something out. Some more shorter shows too. Yeah. If um, so, what we're gonna do? We're gonna try, <laughs> and I, I say try. Meaning try. I know there's a lot of times I've been like, oh yeah, like Eighth Ray Radio is gonna be like, we're gonna go weekly and do this, and it never happens. Um, so what we would like to do um, is do more regular lore casts. Um, to do that though, we will need um, some starter topics, some ideas, some things that you would like answers to um, to kind of help fuel that. So if there's you know, something you want to know more about in the game, you know, maybe you're walking around, you're like, what's like the Gelmora ruins? Like, what's that for? And you want to know more about that? Shoot us an email. Maybe we can dig up some stuff. Um, you know, any, anything like that, um, that you want to know more about in the game, or if you have theories that you'd like to share, um, let us know and we'll, uh, see if we can get those into, uh, some write-ups or, uh, into a new episode of Lorecast. I'm I'm interested to see how that goes because I do I get I get tells I get Twitter messages and I get emails like make more lore casts and about what so yes um, yeah. <laughs> anything you guys want to hear about I want to talk about uh, t- like the wiki needs articles that I mean about pretty much everything lore related we've we've kept up with game mechanics very well but the the lore parts of it are suffering so if you find something you want an article made for let us know that uh if they, you just find something you want to hear us ramble about let us know that um tweet send us an email leave it in the comments of a podcast that we've already put up we're gonna we're gonna watch everything yeah so pr- preferably like the newer podcasts because we'll see those easier um but yeah so if you guys want to get a hold of us, you can email us at aetheriteradio at gamerescape.com. Tweet, a, tweet at us at Aetherite Radio. Um, you know, again, drop uh, comments on the new, uh, once this lore cast goes up, if you have some ideas, let us know. Drop a comment uh, in there up on the blog. Um, we really want to hear what you guys would like to see for, for lore cast. You know, there's a lot of people out there that really enjoy the show um, and the, the kind of content that we bring out. Um, so let us know what kind of content you guys would like to see. And uh, we will do our best to uh, to get stuff out for that. I'm also going to watch the forums. Uh, I mean, if we don't get a lot of input, I mean, there's there's interesting stuff to talk about there. Unlike these big lore casts, we can talk about things that aren't confirmed. We can talk about oh, yeah. very vague theories. We can do dungeon tours because there's so much hidden stuff in the dungeons. We can do whatever anybody <laughs> wants to do. Uh, if people want more shows, let us know what you'd like them to be about. Well, we're happy to come out. Yeah. And uh, I think with that, 
That is going to do it for this episode of Lorecast. Uh, big shout out to everybody that joined us here in Twitch uh, or on Twitch, in Twitch, on Twitch, whichever, listening in live uh, and, and chatting. Um, we will uh, definitely be be looking to uh, to do more of these. So please send us your your feedback and your thoughts and you know ideas and everything. Um, again. Aetherite Radio at GamerEscape.com uh, and Twitter, uh, Aetherite Radio. Uh, so that'll do it for this episode of Lorecast. Big thanks to uh, Unwell for joining me. Hope you guys enjoy this. We're, Anytime. Uh, looking to do these a little more often now with uh, with patches. We'll figure out a, a good uh, kind of spoiler date, maybe maybe a, like two weeks after a patch or something like that, uh, to just kind of get it all out there and you know open it up and talk about it. Um, so look forward to it. Please look forward to it. Please look forward to it. (laughs) All right, guys, take care.